Amazing. It is so good to be back, so good to be home. Um, as Adam said, we had a really wonderful trip and we'll kind of go into a little bit more of, you know, what the Lord um, showed us and spoke to us on that trip uh, at another time. But I just wanted to uh, bring a word this morning to the mums, to um, the women. And so this is kind of the end of our series, Dig Deep. And Adam brought a word to the men and I felt a lot of women, not even that I felt, a lot of women came up and they're like, when's it our turn? And I was like, I've got you, like we'll do this before the series ends. Um, So I wanna bring a word today to the women. Uh, I'm a little jet lagged. So if I stop making sense, just give me a wave and I will re-say what I was saying and I'll make sense. At the 10th, at the 8.30, I didn't get through that sentence um, and people started waving and uh, uh, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, But we've been, yeah, we've been back since Wednesday and so, you know, it's, travel just does funny things to you, right? And there's, jet lag is one thing, but two jet lagged people trying to discuss the theories of jet lag is a really, it's a really different thing. You know, so I'm there like, well, we're nine hours to the east, which is technically that's it's like nine, seventeen 17 hours west if we went the other way and now we're backwards and Adam's like, I don't agree with you. That's not right. And we're so tired and we're both like, you don't know jet lag. I know jet lag. <laughs> it's, it's been terrible and there's been so many moments where we get like so exhausted at like 6 p.m. and we're falling asleep on the couch and the kids are raging. They're happy that we're back and we're like, don't fall asleep. <laughs> We gotta be in this together. We start arguing, we're like, we can't turn on each other now. <laughs> we're nearly there, you know, like it's just, oh, it's been, it's been fun, but it's been wild. Um, and so I just wanna share this morning a couple of things and two things that God has created women to be and two things that the enemy has tried to do to stop and deter women and hold women back from the calling that God has for us. Um, so number one, the first thing that God called Eve, the first woman, but all women to be is a helper. Now, helper, when we look at the Scripture, and I'm gonna just do this and preach a little quicker because the service is a bit long. Um, But when we look at this Scripture in Genesis where we first hear about Eve, right? God sees Adam, He sees man, and He says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm gonna make a helper for him. And the original word there, helper, it just means helper. Just helpful, right? A helper. And so a helper is somebody who, when they are there, they help, they, they make the opportunity for you to do things you otherwise couldn't do or do them better because there's a helper there. That's our role as women, right? We're supposed to help. And so interestingly in Genesis, when God recognises Adam needed a helper, the first thing that He does is He creates beasts from the earth. Before He creates woman, He creates all these other animals and Adam names those animals. And then He says, there's still no helper right for him. So I'll put him to sleep and I'll take a rib and I'll make a woman. And so then Adam wakes up and he's like, wow, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she's woman, she's come out of man and now things are great. And so now there's this calling on on men and women to come together, to leave their father and their mother and come together and be made one again like Adam and Eve and live in this function of marriage and live in this function of God's design. And so the role essentially of a woman, although we don't love it as much in this modern day and age, is that our role is to help men. Ugh, it's yuck even saying it. It's like, ugh. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love this and I am for it, okay? No, it is, it is our role to help, right? And so, and I'm not always the most helpful. I try to be helpful, but... You can't always be helpful, like I'm doing my best. Uh, But sometimes I'm not the most helpful. And you know, in this whole trip and this season of travelling that we've done, I've realised I'm maybe not the best help in these scenarios. And so we went on this trip and there's six of us on the trip. And you immediately learn whether or not someone trusts you when you have a map in your hand. (laughs) When you're holding a map, Suddenly I realise I'm standing back now. I don't really do maps, so I'm not the best. So I'm actually just like the travel princess. Everyone just tells me where to go. I didn't know what flights we were on or what times we were leaving. I didn't know anything. So I'm just like, tell me what to do. When should I have my bag packed and where should I go? And so I don't have a map in my hand, but I realise the five other people on this trip, no one trusts anybody. Everybody's got a map. Everybody's making their own way to where we're going. And it just showed me that there's just no trust and no love in this travel group. So except for me. And so I had, my, uh, I had my moment where I was like, okay guys, I've been looking online. I know what we need to eat in Japan. I know what we need to do. So I'm gonna take us to this ramen restaurant. Leave it to me, I'm gonna get us there. And so Adam immediately is like speaking death over it. And he's like, she can't do it. She can't read maps. She's not gonna get us there, guys. Don't trust her. And I'm like, that's a, that's a you issue, babe. I'm gonna lead this group. 
So I start leading the group and I'm like, follow me. And you know, I'm trying to, the, trying to get the blue dot to load on the map. And I'm, you know, cause I don't know how you look at maps unless they're in the direction that you're going, right? Like, well, I don't know. So I'm like, all right, let's gonna get there. So we get there and we go, we were at this temple and we, we pr- like go to this temple, we pray, we have communion. And I'm like, okay, it's a 20 minute walk from here to the ramen shop. So it's not like a small thing, it's a decent trip. So I'm the leader for 20 minutes and the only 20 minutes I led this whole trip. But I'm the leader and I'm navigating the map and so I'm getting us there and I'm like, leave it with me guys, I know we're gonna get there. And I, we get there and I'm like, okay, this is it. This is the ramen place. And they're like, well, where is it exactly, is, you know? So I'm looking around, I'm not seeing the sign. Uh, I'm like, you know, but it should be right here, right? And I'm, are the dots there and I'm on the dot. Like we are on it, this is, we're here. And so then Adam's like, let me see your phone, babe. What is, you know, he grabs my phone and he's like, Grace, did you not see the red writing permanently closed? It's been on the map this whole time. And I was like, you know what? That's my bad. Uh, So we did a 20 minute walk to a closed ramen restaurant. Closed for a few years, guys. There was no sign. It was gone, long gone. And so then we caught a taxi to another ramen place and it was fine. But I did get us there. In my, to credit myself, I did get us there. I just, the ramen shop wasn't there where I got us. So, but that's not really on me, is it? (laughs) No, it totally is. So, you know, we're, we're supposed to be a helper, right? But we maybe we're not always helpful, but that's ultimately our design. We're supposed to help. Now, we have this very different in this day and age where we've kind of come more into this equality movement where everything is equal and everything is fair. Now, I, I think what's so interesting when I speak to people who are married or I talk about marriage is in this context, in this church, I'm quite a decisive person, right? So I lead lots of departments, I do lots of things. And so I'm in the office and I'm like, yes to that, no to that. This is what we're gonna do. This is where we're going. That's my role here. And sometimes I think that's who people think I am everywhere. But when I go home, that's not my role. Like I'm not going home and being this grace in my home. When I go home, I'm a wife and I'm a mother. And so there's a different version of me at home. I don't, I'm not the decider, I'm not the authoritative leader in my home. I'm not the, the, you know, the person giving direction and the person making the call. That's not who I am there. That is who I am here in some ways, but ultimately there's a structure to the home that we're supposed to come under. And I think sometimes because we don't see people in different contexts, we just assume that they're that way everywhere that they go. So I might be very forward in church and I might be very strong, but at home, I'm not the boss and I'm actually okay with that. And the jokes of like, you know, she's the boss and she wears the pants. Listen, just come to my house for five minutes. You'll realise pretty quickly that's not how things go down. I'm the wife, right? So we don't, Adam and I personally, just so you know, we don't have this equal shared home life. We never have. So Adam doesn't do the laundry. He sometimes does. He's very nice. Yesterday, oh, come on. It's in the the machine. You didn't even put it in the dryer. I heard the machine. (laughs) I heard it last night. It sung its little song and I thought that stuff's not going in the dryer. And it isn't, guys. I'll send you a video when I get home, I'll show you. So he does sometimes, he does sometimes. But you know, he doesn't, he's not doing the housework equally with me. He's not cooking with me. He's not doing that. If it's a barbecue, yes, of course. I don't touch the barbecue. I don't know what that thing does. It's outside, it's for men, okay? But I'm also not doing the lawns and I'm not doing, and I'm not taking out the bins. And if I do have to take out the bins, the neighbours will know about it because the sigh that comes out of the pits of my stomach is so loud. And I'm agreeable. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll put the bins out. (sighs) Like, I don't want to. So that's not this equal thing, right? But my role at home is to be a helper. Now, unfortunately, in this day and age, a lot of us women have to work. And to the women who were like, equal rights, we wanna work, stuff those guys. (laughs) Why did they do this to us, okay? They really messed it up. Now we're all working and we still have to do the washing and the cooking. It's just not right. But anyway, but you know, this, this goal is that we were supposed to help, right? So now we, we do, we help. The second thing that women are designed to be is she is supposed to be a blessing in his life, right? The Bible says in Proverbs 18, a man who finds a wife finds a treasure. Some people say finds a good thing. You're supposed to be a good thing. But we have this really funny way now of like, well, if I want a man, well, he better meet all of my needs and he better make me, you know, happy and he better, and I'm not this and that, and he better do this. That's not what, that's not what blessing, helping women do. 
We're supposed to actually come together under the design God created and make each other's lives better. Not have someone come and like meet my list of demands. And if he does this, oh no, forget it, he's out. Like it's just because the culture has turned us away very, very subtly and very, very slowly, but we've arrived outside the plan of God. And it looks really good and it sounds good. It makes a lot of sense. It should be equal. It should be fair. That makes sense, right? Why should one person do everything? Split the housework, split the work with the kids, except then we've got two mums and we kind of don't have a dad. And then we all cry that we don't have a dad. We all cry that the men aren't strong except we ask them to be co-mums. We ask them to nurture, we ask them to be feminine, we ask them to care like a mother and then complain they couldn't be a father. Very, very subtle, very slowly. But my kids have a very clear mum and a very clear dad. And maybe I'm too much of a mum and I'm not firm enough and my son gets away with a lot, but then eventually dad comes home and he fixes it, right? Like whatever, (laughs) right? But we're in our designs, we're supposed to be that way. And so I think we just have to slightly challenge the modern way because it's not a biblical way. And yes, we work and we do have to, you know, I'm not saying men fold your arms and wait for dinner to be served in front of you. That's, come on guys, help a little. I'm just saying, all right, I'll I'll leave it. But (laughs) there is this call to be a blessing, right? And we see this in Proverbs 31. We've got this woman, this, you know, I used to read this chapter before I got married when I was delusional and I would think, (laughs) I could be this woman, you know, this is going to be me. I'm going to spin yarn and I'm going to do it all. And the thing about this woman is she's not even just at home. She also works. She trades. She's like selling vineyards and whatnot. Like who is she? Anyway, it says in verse 10 of chapter 31, it says, Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her. She will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. Man, she sounds amazing. Like, I don't know her, but she seems great. But, you know, she does all of this stuff. And so I was reading this and I want to be like that. And I still have this delusional aspiration that I could maybe try to be like this woman. And then I was reading it and I was like, you know, I used to think that before I started working. Now I work. So there's no clean washing. It is what it is. I can't do that too. You know, like I can't also clean the clothes and work and, you know, show up and be great. So I, you know, I've just accepted that. And so people from my family will visit me when they're on holiday here, they'll visit me. And there's some kind of unspoken agreement that they'll do all my washing. And I'm not saying anything because I love it, but somehow they come and they just like empty the washing baskets and they fill up again until another visitor decides to come. And in the meantime, if we don't have socks, we buy socks sometimes. And you know, <laughs> is it the best thing? No, but it's happening. So it's not perfect. But I was reading this scripture and I was like, man, how does this woman do it? You know, there's got to be something about this I don't understand. I can't do it. And can I tell you, I found the answer. I found the answer, guys. It's in verse 15. And it says this, she gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household. Good for her. Like it's a bit of a brag, but okay. And then it says, and she plans the day's work for her servant girls. (laughs) I knew there was a catch. I knew it. I knew it wasn't me. The fact is she has servant girls and not just one, she has multiple. She has many and I have two girls living with me and they don't do much, you know? (laughs) So either I'm gonna have to get them to really step up and I'm gonna plan the work for those two little girls who live with me uh, or I'm gonna accept that I can't be this woman because I don't have servants. So I just wanna release all the women in this room right now. I release you. Unless you have servants, you don't have to be Proverbs 31. No, we, we, we should try. But, you know, this is, this is basically who we're called to be, right? We're supposed to bless not only our husbands, but we're actually, there's a grace on us as women to just be a blessing everywhere we go. You know, and there are some women who really carry this. Like I know women who are so amazing. They just make you feel good. They care for you. They're so maternal and they're not your mom. Or, like they're just, you, when you're around them, you feel better. They encourage you. I wanna be like those women. And I don't know if any of you have had any meals at the Howans house. Anyone been to Phil and Deanne Howans house? Incredible, you'll love it. It's incredible. Deanne is this woman. She makes fresh bread rolls. She just, she's the best. And I go to their house and I think, I wanna be like this one day. I aspire to be like Deanne Howan. She's got it all. We moved house. She made us a 
She made us some food because we were moving house when we bought our house. And, you know, it's one thing to be kind and to be helpful, but it's another thing to know exactly what people want to eat on the day they move house. She knows. She gave us this sausage roll thing, lots of strawberries. It was 10 out of 10. Proverbs 31, Deanne. She's gonna, I'm going to get her to come and do some lessons, some teaching. She's going to pray for us because we need it. But this is actually a gift, right? So she carries that and she's not my mum or my wife or, you know, she's just a woman who carries this. We have the potential to bless even outside of our home. We have the potential to bless everything we touch and everywhere we go and the people around us. That is God's design for us to help. People should leave where we are and say, man, it was better with her there. She made it better. That's actually the design God gave us. Not she made it worse or awkward or hard. She, she made it good. I liked having her there. I like her being around. She makes me feel good. That's the ability we have as women, right? But we know that Eve got into this conversation with the serpent and sin came into the world. So Eve is in this conversation and the serpent comes to her and I won't read it, but he comes to her and he says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And Eve responds to him and she says, no, no, God didn't say that. He said, don't eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And so she gets into this conversation with the serpent. Next thing you know, she's eaten the fruit and sins entered the world. The serpent didn't go for Adam. He went for Eve. And can I challenge you, this is still how he attacks our families. It is still how he attacks our households. He knows. And the Bible actually says that the woman is the weaker vessel. That's so rude. I know it's, it's a little offensive. And I do like to think I'm strong physically. And I am, I am quite strong. And there are those days where I can't open a jar, you know? And I am damned if I need help from my husband. I will not, I will not ask. And he can hear me grunting in the kitchen. I'm like, Rrr. and he's like, you need, a hand? you need a hand in there? And I'm like, no, I don't. And I get the knife, smack the sides of the jar. I'll do whatever it takes. I am not asking for help from this man, except when it's the blender. Anyone got one of those cup blenders? And it's not that I'm weak. It's that the cup is so huge. I cannot undo that lid. And I can't smack it with a knife either. So eventually sometimes I have to bring it to him in humility and shame. (laughs) And he has to open it. But the reality is, right, even physically we're weaker. Physically, we are weaker. We're not the stronger. We're not the head. And the enemy knows that. He knows that we're weaker. And so he attacks the weaker of the two. Any person who knows anything about strategy knows that's what you do. You wanna take something down, you go to the weakest link, right? And so Eve was the weakest link. And unfortunately, we still are the weakest link because we're not men. We're not the head of the home. We're not the leaders. We are the helpers. We are the make everything better people, right? But the enemy still comes for women. And so there's two things that he does and two ways that he attacks women that I wanna address this morning because if we can open our eyes to his strategy, if we can recognise, oh, this is how the enemy comes after me as a woman, we immediately take him out. We immediately, like we outsmart him as soon as we understand how he works, right? And I really feel like in some ways we haven't outsmarted him. But when we, we see this in two ways. So number one, she stops helping and she starts controlling. This is what we do as women. And I was at a women's conference yesterday and someone was talking about control and they were like, ha, 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 you know, who doesn't love to control everything? Put your hand up if you love control. And everyone just went, yeah. And I just thought mass deliverance at the end. We'll fix this. <laughs> Guys, we'll, we'll deal with control. Because I had a spirit of control, right? And I got freedom from that. But interestingly, if you go back to when sin entered the world, the curse that was given to women, the curse for man was you'll toil the ground, it'll be hard. The curse that was given to women was two things. Number one, you'll have pain in your childbirth, which we all know. And number two, your desire will be for your husband. Some other translations say your desire will be to control your husband. Control is not just one spirit that attacks some people. Control is actually a strategy from the enemy that always attacks women. It always attacks womanhood because control is the opposite to submission, right? And God calls us, submit, wives, submit to your husband, come under him, let him lead. But everything in us is like, just make it my way. Just a little bit more how I would like it. There's this innate desire to control. And I've got two daughters and they already bend this way. They're already trying to control things. It's not just 
you know, it's not just one spirit that some women have to deal with. It's actually the default of sin in humankind. But we know that when Jesus died and He was made a sacrifice for us, He paid for the curse of sin. So we are all living with the acceptance that women are controlling, except that Jesus died for that already. And we don't have to live under that anymore. And so for us as Christian women who have come into the fullness of what God promises us, we don't have to be like this. We can actually come fully into the grace God gave us as women and stop controlling everything. But unfortunately, this is just quite accepted in the body, right? But we have to realise this is not from the Lord. Control is not from the Lord. I need everything to be right so that I can just be at peace. Not from the Lord. If you just didn't do this and this, I wouldn't feel this way. Not from the Lord. That's called manipulation. It's actually manipulation. And I I think what's interesting is once I got set free from that spirit, I realised it is everywhere. It's everywhere. People are manipulating people all the time. Like emotional manipulation happens all the time. And, and, I, and I think what's interesting about it is when I was like this, I wasn't intentionally manipulating anyone. I wasn't thinking, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna, you know, be all sad and then he's gonna feel bad. Like it's not intent, it's just happening, right? You're not purposely being emotional to try to get your husband to move. It's just happening because you're defaulting to what your flesh wants to do. It's just the flesh, right? But we need to get the like blinders off and recognise, oh, this is actually not how God created me to be. And if you're married, can I tell you, there's a really powerful tool in just laughing things off. You know, you can just laugh it off. Like when I was really controlling, I needed everything to be resolved and explained and you need to take back what you said and you need to, like I needed it all like that. But now... I just think it's not worth that. Whatever, I'll just get over it. And I honestly couldn't do that before. I couldn't get over things on my own. It had to be, you know, made right the way I needed it to be made right. Now I just laugh. And if you're married to a man, (laughs) they make a lot of noise. The grunting, the sneezing, the sounds. It'll make you crazy. It'll make you pack a bag, you know. You'll be like, I'm done with this. I can't listen to any more snorting or coughing. And it's not even the coughing. It's the, it's the voice box that goes alongside the, the coughing. Do you know what I, Yeah, it's like, <laughs> And so there was one night when we were away where, and, and I try to be real, I'm honestly trying to be, I'm trying to be a great wife, right? And there was this one night, we're all jet lagged. We're on the wrong time zones. I think we'd gone to Istanbul from, from Tokyo. And so Adam gets up in the night and he needs to drink And so he's drinking, which is loud enough. It's like, glug, glug, glug. But it wasn't the glugging. It was the, uh, uh. And I didn't say anything. I'm like trying to like, let it go, Grace. Like, you gotta laugh it off, right? And then the next day, probably like six or seven hours into the day, I still was really bothered by it. And I was like, I've just gotta say something. So I was like, babe, um, I don't want this to offend you, but last night you made a lot of sound and uh, I'm quite jet lagged. If you could just not yell alongside your gulping, <laughs> that would be fantastic for me. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> and so he took it well and it was fine and he has never done that again. Glory to the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But you know, sometimes you've just got to, like you've, you've got to learn how to make it light, right? We're all humans, we make mistakes. But when you're operating under control, everything is serious, you know, and everything someone else does is intentional. It's not. It's actually not intentional. Most of the time, people are trying to be great. Most of the time, your husband's not even noticing that he's doing something wrong. People are not. But control tells you, that was on purpose. How dare they? They shouldn't, this and that. That's the voice of control. And it's the default of most women. It's the curse of sin on women. And if we can wake up to that and recognise that, we can just go, oh Lord, I don't want this. I don't wanna be like this. And imagine how beautiful the church would become if the women just became like better, like nicer, kinder, not controlling, not upset, not angry. There's such a grace from the Lord that I honestly believe is untapped in the women of God. I really feel like we have not understood this properly. We've not recognised it for what it is and we could be so much freer to the point where everywhere we go, we make things better because we're helpers. That's who God created us to be. So the second thing 
that the enemy does to trap women. Number two, she stops blessing and she starts cursing. And if you look at the New Testament, so when I was preparing this message, I thought I'm gonna just go to the Bible and look at all the Scriptures for women, right? That's my starting point for any message. I'm speaking to women, I'm gonna look at what does the Bible say? And so all the Scriptures, especially in the New Testament, have this direct correlation between women and gossip. This connection between women and slander, like criticism, negative talk. And and every single woman in here is not surprised by that. And neither are the men, let's be real. Um, (laughs) None of us are. But this is actually the default for women. And it's the issue that women are constantly up against. Timothy, when Paul's speaking to Timothy in the book of Titus, it's constantly addressing, make sure the women are not gossiping and not slandering. That's the issue of the church. Can I tell you, it's still the issue. And it isn't just women, it's also men. But for women, it's an issue. And I really feel like, man, as Christians, we're so like, we wanna do right by the Lord, you know? And we're like, okay, God, what's, you know, what's in my life that shouldn't be there? What's going on in the church that shouldn't be there? What are the spirits that attack the church that we need to be aware of? Like our intentions are so good, but somehow the spirit of criticism has flown under the radar. Where in this day and age, that's actually not a big issue. Like people build movements on criticising other people. How did it get here? Like how did we get to the point where we are so blinded to how this spirit works that we have all accepted it? And we live in a society where we are safe, right? We're safe in New Zealand. No one's persecuting you. No one's beating you up in the car park because you do the wrong thing. The only weapon people have against you is their words. That's the only weapon we use against one another in our day and age is words. Yet we care so much what people think and what people will say. And it is a barrier to God using us. There is a critical spirit in, in many people, in the church, in our society that we are pretending isn't there. And what the Lord showed me when I was preparing this is that you know everything in the Kingdom of God is built on words. It's a Kingdom of words. Prophecy is words that build up the Kingdom of God. And I feel like there's a deception that criticism is like a neutral thing. Prophecy builds, we speak life, you know, we speak faith, we build the Kingdom of God, but criticism is kind of in this neutral place. Can I tell you, it isn't. Criticism builds the Kingdom of darkness. Criticism is building, it is building something else in your life. We pray for people all the time and we pray against curse words. Do you notice when you're praying for people, you're like, man, I just sense there's words spoken against you, there's curses spoken against you. You know, it isn't witches casting curses, it's Christians. There are Christians who say more curse words than witches because what comes out of their mouth is rubbish. What comes out of their mouth builds the kingdom of darkness. It isn't neutral. It isn't doing nothing. It's actually destroying everything around you. And it's the trap of the enemy inside of the church. That's what I really felt when I was preparing this. So I wanna show you some Scriptures where this is highlighted to be important. So 1 Timothy chapter three is a chapter that's talking about how to appoint church leaders. So some versions say deacon, some versions say church leader. And it gives you this list of what kind of man you're looking for, what kind of person you're looking for. And it talks about their home life and all kinds of different things. You know, he needs to be generous, he needs to be hospitable, know how to teach, la, 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 la. And then it says in verse 10, Before they're appointed, let them pass the test, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. Very specific. They must be, they must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. Because criticism is a lack of self-control. When you can't control yourself, you can't control your mouth, right? Your mouth becomes out of control. So don't choose a church leader who has a wife who gossips. Like, and you would think to yourself, well, why does that really matter? But gossip is actually what kills the church. You know, when a new believer comes into the church, and I hate to say this, but this is true. When a new believer comes into the church, someone gets saved. There are default people in the church. You think, man, I kind of low key hope they don't strike up a great friendship with them because I know the spirit on that person. And I know that they're critical. And I know that people leave the church because of what they say. And it's not that they leave and go find another church. They just leave. They just don't follow the Lord anymore. That's the power of your words. Criticism makes people lose their salvation. That's what it does. Criticism makes people walk away from following God. And one day we'll give an account for the words that we say. 
an account will be given. So if you think this is neutral, you're wrong. It's not neutral. It's not just kind of neither here nor there. It's very serious and it matters to God. And we know that if we go back, and I reference this Scripture every time I talk about words, is we go back to the seven things that God hates, the abominations to Him. Three of those seven come out of your mouth. Lying, sowing discord among the brethren and giving a false witness. All of those things God hates. It's not like He thinks they're not so good for you. He thinks they're, you know, a concern. No, He hates them. Yet we've created a church culture where we tolerate three out of the seven things He hates. And I can tell you now, if someone came into this church and shed innocent blood, because that's another one, we'd be outraged. We'd be like, whoa, that's not okay. Rise up, do something about it. That's not good. God hates that. Except the criticism though, we're just all good with that. Spill the tea. Spill the tea, my friend. Tell me. And you have no idea that what's coming out of your mouth, although may be true to you, what you're doing is you're speaking death. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You are killing things with your mouth. And I really felt like not just, you know, to, to kind of share this, but I actually felt to warn people. You need to be warned and some people actually need to repent. And I have many times had to repent. Like, Lord, I repent for what I've said. I overstepped. I wish I hadn't done that. I've gone to people many times. I take back what I said. I shouldn't have said that. I crossed the line. I hope you have conviction enough to do that. But there are some people, this is, you're so used to this. You're, this is seasoned in you now. But the Lord is raising up a church who speak life. He's raising up a body of believers who shift the atmosphere because we are of a different spirit. We know Caleb and Joshua went in and instead of bringing a bad report and criticism and negativity, they said, we can take these giants. And God blessed them and He killed the 10 critics. Do you know that? They, 10 of them and all of their families got sucked into a hole. God hates criticism. He hates grumbling. He hates complaining. He hates murmuring. And it has always been and still is the plan of the enemy against women. And you know, we know this as women because you go into a room with women and you're a little bit nervous. Like if you go to an event, it's just women. Don't tell me you're not more nervous. You are. Don't tell me you care more about what you're wearing to that than when there's a whole bunch of other people there. Don't tell me you're not taking your hair and makeup more seriously when you know it's just women at this event. You know it is. We're not even nice to each other. And we walk away from things like that and we think, oh, Father, they're probably talking about me. Right? And honestly, they probably are. <laughs> Sometimes. Right? But we're not, we're not even nice to each other. Like we can't even speak life over each other because we're all so insecure. And so we say mean things, but that mean stuff is just coming from insecurity. But imagine if we could fully harness who God's made us to be. Imagine we could be women that not only help, but speak life and bless with our words everything that we do. Imagine if we understood the power of the tongue to speak blessings and not curses. Man, our lives would look completely different because we as women hold the ability to set the temperature of our homes, the temperature of our marriages. And there are so many, we saw this beautiful service, all the men got up, it was beautiful, it was stunning. So proud of them. And such a, a high ratio of men to women in this church, which is phenomenal, right? And so the Lord's really birthing like a, a real, um, a sense to kind of really build strong men and build a strong men's ministry because that's what will really shift this nation, right? So we have all these men up there and you know, it's amazing. And there's all this beautiful reconciliation. And I just felt like, man, I wonder what was the dialogue of the women after that? Did we speak life over that? Did we take that opportunity and say, yes, my husband's amazing. He's gonna become this, it's good. Did we speak good things? Did we understand our potential to either build on to what happened that Sunday or completely destroy it in two words when he walked in the door? Do we understand that we hold that kind of power? That as women, we hold the power to make our husbands great or crush them? The fact is I could destroy this man. I could, I could every day just eat away at him. You're not this, you're not that think you're so good, rah, rah, rah. I could over time wear him down to completely miss out and abdicate the call of God on his life. I could. That's the power I hold as a woman. And some of us don't realise we have that power in our homes and we are not wielding the weapon of faith and of love the way that we should, where we speak against the enemy and we speak life into our family. 
where we speak against the enemy and we build up our husbands. That's the grace on us. And to me, that's not a condemnation. That's exciting. To me, that's a gift. And so this goes into so many other things and I won't read you all the Scriptures, but another one I wanted to point out is it talks about widows. And so there's an obligation as a church to look after older women who have no family who could look after them, right? And so we're praying about this as a church and who those women are in our church and how do we care for them because they need to be cared for and it's very clear in the Bible, right? But it talks about this list of widows. Now, younger widows are referenced in this chapter, which is 1 Timothy 5. And so younger women, younger widows are women with children, usually. So back then you had to marry. Your whole society functioned on marriage. And if your husband died, then you needed to find another husband because you really couldn't live a life without a husband. Nowadays, we have a government that looks after women whose husbands have died or left them or whatever. So this is kind of a word to single women, especially those with children. And it actually gives a warning to these women. And it says, don't put them on this list of care if they're under the age of 65, because they should remarry. And I'll just pick up from this verse. It says that they should remarry, then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. Like they can't commit to staying a widow, they should remarry. And it says, if they are on the list, they will learn to be lazy and will spend their time gossiping from house to house, meddling in other people's business and talking about things that they shouldn't. That's what happens to women who don't have a husband, who have time. What? Like I read that and I was like, I can't even read that in church. Someone's going to throw something at me. (laughs) Like, but it's this, like, and I don't say that, not to condemn single women, but men, wake up to the way that the enemy is going to trip you up. And it actually goes on to say, they'll be deceived by Satan. Like they'll actually fall away because they're so, their hands are idle. They don't have a man. And this is what men are supposed to do, men. You're supposed to call your wife higher. When she's having one of those days, which she'll have because she's a human being and she's being negative and she's being critical, it's the role of a husband to say, babe, don't talk like that. Babe, don't be like that. Come on, like that's, that's not true. I think you're being a bit harsh. But men can't say that anymore because women are so controlling that if you say that, well, then we throw a fit. And then the whole house is upside down for seven days because you pissed me off. (laughs) Ultimately, right? So control and criticism are good mates because you can be a critic if you have the spirit of control and then no one can tell you what to do, right? Because you just manipulate them with your emotions or with your behaviour and essentially you control everything. That is not who you are, ladies. That is how the enemy wants you to live. And I just wanna say, man, God's calling us out of that. He's calling us higher. He is really raising up a body of women who shift the dialogue of what a woman is. We're not a ball and chain. We're not a headache. We're not like a pain in the butt that everyone's got it. Oh, here she is. She's, man, we don't have to be that. We could actually be, oh, great, she's here. The room's gonna get better with her in it. Like, isn't that what you wanna be? That's the potential in all of us. But it's hard, it's self-sacrificing. It means you don't get the indulgence of being a critic. Because I tell you what, that feels good, right? All sin does. We wonder why people love criticism just like they love lust, just like they love addiction. It feels good. That's why the world loves it. Our culture is so full of gossip, but it's not a good thing. It's not a godly thing and we have to stop tolerating it. So I actively and regularly pray the spirit of criticism out of this church. And sometimes, a lot of the time, people just leave. They just say, you know, God's calling me on. I'm like, bless you. (laughs) Blessings. That's a win for us. That's like, oh, thank you, Lord. We don't need, because again, like I said, it's not just about that person and their heart. Criticism leaks everywhere. It leaks onto everyone. And it's building death and destruction in your world. Never mind my world. I can pray off the words you speak over me. All good. I can cover my children. I can pray for the people that you're around. I can talk to them. I can scoop them up and say, God loves you. Never mind that weird stuff they said. But you, your world, that's in trouble. I'm not worried about it for my sake, but I'm worried for yours because you're building destruction into everything in your life because the Kingdom of God operates on words. So you can choose what kind of words you're gonna speak, blessings or curses. And women, we have got to stop speaking curses because it feels nice and it's easy. And it really, really is. But God's calling us higher. 
So we know that Proverbs 18, 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Oh, but what about like if I've had a bad day? Come on, what about if like someone was really rude to me and I just feel like telling someone else and my other six friends? No, let no corrupting word come out of your mouth. They're the conversations we have inside with the Lord. But no, our culture now is like, I've just got to tell someone. Can I tell you what it does when someone talks critical words to you? I know, I know what you think. You think, yeah, but I'm just helping them. I'm their saviour. Like I know that they have stuff that they're saying and they shouldn't say that, but I'm just a listening ear. No, you're talking with the Spirit. And over time, that Spirit sows seeds of bitterness, confusion and doubt into you. And then one day you have an offence of your own. One day you're wronged. One day someone lets you down. And then all those seeds that your critical friends sowed out of just conversation, we're just, we're just nutting it out. We're just sharing. You pick up all those seeds and suddenly we've got a forest of bitterness and hurt and offence. But they're not your seeds. They're not your hurts. They're not your wounds. They're not your problems. They're all the things you picked up being a really good friend being a really good listener. I have watched this happen time and time again. So someone might be telling you, this person offended me, Sarah offended me. And I go to Glenn and I say, you know what Sarah did? She did this, 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 this. For for a long time, Glenn, she did this. Now she's done this. And Glenn's like, hey, just love her. Just pray for her. It's okay. And he's being good. And then one day Sarah offends Glenn. And Glenn goes, I knew she was like this. Why? Not because of his experience, not because of who she is with him, because of all of that talk, because of all of that criticism. This is one of the best strategies the enemy has. It is like 10 out of 10. He's crushing it with this strategy and people are blind to it. So we have to not only stop being critics, stop sitting with critics. Stop tolerating this kind of conversation. Stop sitting with women and talking about your husband and listening to them talk about theirs. It's not from the Lord. Let no corrupting word come out of your mouth. And if you care about the person in front of you, don't let it come out of theirs either because it's corrupting them. We're supposed to speak life. It says that you would, the words you have would give grace to those who hear. Is what I'm saying bringing grace? Because grace is like, They've had a hard time, right? We have this conversation with the Lord. Man, I'm upset, I'm offended. But grace says they're doing the best they can. They probably didn't mean it. Grace says, do you know what? Just forgive, I've forgiven you. Extend the forgiveness you received from Jesus to this person, done and dusted. Not tell 65 people and then maybe have some grace. It's just not the way the Lord designed us to do it. So I'd just love you to stand to your feet as we wrap it up. Another scripture that I felt was really important when it comes to women is there's this scripture that talks about older women training the younger women to love their husbands and honour their children. And I really feel that's becoming a lost art in our society. That as young people, you know, and this is all through scripture, the young people think that they know better and the young people pioneer forward. But actually there are older people in our communities who have wisdom to impart to us. So I wanna honour all of the older women. And I wanna ask, if you are an older woman who loves the Lord and has gone on a journey with the Lord, we need you to impart that to us. Us younger women, we need you. We need your wisdom. We need your experience. We need your love. And the older women, if they come under this attack of criticism and control, we lose the opportunity to glean from them. We can't have you pour out into us all the things that God has taught you because now you're the critic too. So God is actually calling all of us as women to harness the potential that we have to create a beautiful world around us. There is so much power inside of every single woman and no man can, can bring what we bring. And that's why the trans thing is so offensive. You're not graced to do what we do. You, you, don't, you don't have it in you. God built us to do this. It is deeply inside of us. And so we have this power with our words to either bring life or bring death. And we can either help or we can make it really hard. But I just wanna challenge you as a woman to consider, okay, Lord, what parts of my life, what parts of my conversation, what parts of my heart are not operating with the way that You designed me? Now, I wanna walk into every room and know I'm here. I'm a woman in this room. I'm gonna make it better. 
I'm gonna love on somebody. I'm gonna speak life over somebody. You know, you have an ability to nurture and care for people who aren't even your children because nurturing is a gift. Men don't have that. They're so rough. They're like, you know, they're just not, they don't get it, right? But we, we get it. So even if you don't have children, there are people you can love and nurture. Even if your children have gone, they've grown up and flown the nest. There are people who need mothering. Even older women and mothers still need a mother. They still need a conversation where a mum comes in and says, it's gonna be all right. That's what mothers do. So I just wanna pray for us as we end this service. And I wanna give an opportunity that if you find that you've resonated with either this control or the criticism, that God actually can set you free from that. You can right from this very moment, never operate like that again. That's the ability that we have because of the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus. He sets people free immediately. You don't have to walk out with this. You don't have to go on a year long journey of untangling the web of control. It's all good, we'll break it right now. We'll end it right now. We will walk out of this room today as women who are gonna make that world a better place, as women who are gonna change the atmospheres around us. Man, I feel so passionate that this, the devil thought he was so smart. He thought he was so clever, but we outsmarted him this time and we aren't gonna fall for his tricks because we have the potential to just breathe life into everything around us. So if you would just close your eyes and I just wanna challenge even some of the men, if you've operated from that place of criticism and you've spoken death, some of us actually need to like recant and repent over some of the things that we've said. People have said, oh, I have no money. This will never work. My kid's gone. This is a problem. This is a problem. You have prophesied death over things in your life. And you need to actually take back those words and say, I break my agreement with the words that I've spoken. I take them back, Lord, and I speak life over that situation. Because the words you spoke, even in the past, they still have power. So we need to take back those words and we need to say, God, I wanna do it differently. I wanna speak life. So Lord, I just pray right now, if there's anyone who wants to make that change or receive that prayer, just put your hand up and please keep your eyes closed. Lord, I just pray right now over every person Lord, for anybody who has operated under a spirit of criticism, for anybody who has sat under critical words or who has spoken critical words, Lord, we repent right now for every critical word we've spoken. Lord, we're sorry where we have spoken death when You called us to speak life. And Lord, we take back every critical word now in Jesus' Name. We break its power now in the Name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask, would You wash our tongues? Would You purify our mouths? Would You wash our hearts? right now, that Lord, we'd be people who speak life, that God, we would be a body of believers who see the best and say the best. So God, I pray that You will put joy in the mouth of every person with their hands raised. I pray God, You would raise up prophecy in the mouth of every person with their hands raised, that God, we would speak life, that Lord, we would prophesy and things will change by the power of the Word of the Lord that comes out of our mouth. Lord, I thank You that You're doing a work, a permanent, change in us right here and right now. And Lord, I pray for anyone battling the voice of control. Lord, we know the curse of sin is already broken. So Father, we step into the fullness of the cross and we reject the curse that we will control our husbands or our desire would be for our husbands. And Father, we receive the fullness of what Jesus paid for. You became a curse so that we could be free from the curse of sin. And we receive that freedom afresh right now in Jesus' Name. Lord, would You just touch us with Your presence right now. Wash over us with Your Spirit. And my spirit is full of anticipation that this is actually a really important moment for a lot of us. That Father, would You raise us up as a church who knows how to speak life. Lord, that we would be a body so full of Your love and Your joy that people would come in and know the difference. That God, criticism would leave the room that criticism would leave the church, that God, we'd be a place that is a reflection of Your glory and Your goodness. In Jesus' mighty Name, we thank You, Lord. We thank You for the hearts that You're ministering to right now. And I just really feel it's a line in the sand for a lot of people. And you don't have to walk out of here still in a battle. You just walk out of here knowing this is done. It's done. And we're walking into a new grace and a new language and a new way. So Father, I just thank You for Your goodness, Your mercy. His mercies are new every morning. Everything You've said before, it's washed away now, it's done. And we receive Your mercy, Lord. We give You glory in Jesus' Name.